Welcome back to TD Physics and learning about optics and mirrors. So in previous videos, we've learned that when you look at yourself in a regular plane mirror, just those regular flat ones you often see at home, you're going to look the same size, you're going to be right side up, and the distance from what appears to be you on the other side of the mirror will be the same as you actually in front of the mirror. We've also learned that convex mirrors the ones that are typically labeled on your car, objects in the mirror, are closer than they appear, and also found in places like convenience stores and areas with tight corridors, sometimes like hospital hallways, as well as parking garages, that you're always going to look smaller and right side up. And that image is going to be uh, behind the mirror again. When it comes to concave mirrors, the ones that bend inwards, the situation is a lot more complicated. The other ones, the other two examples, wherever you were in front of them, the image properties were always going to be the same. But for concave ones, there's actually going to be five different scenarios, and it depends very much on where you are in front of it, or the object that you're looking at. So unlike our convex mirrors that would take parallel rays of light and spread them out, concave mirrors are going to do the opposite. They're going to take those parallel beams of light and they are going to converge when we come uh, to a focal point. And so in some solar applications of this, uh, parallel rays of light from the sun are used to be brought together and are used to generate uh, different types of energy, usually heat, and then converted to electricity. Uh, this can also be used uh, to cook things. Uh, common uses are uh, solar ovens particularly for developing nations. It changed the lives of many people. But let's go look at what the ray diagrams look like and how they can be used to predict what you're actually going to look like or an object is going to look like in front of one of these mirrors. So we take a quick look at a photo of these sort of things and we discover that it's a lot different from what we've seen before. You see that uh, the lady standing in front of the mirror, um, her hand, that's quite close to the mirror, it looks really large and is right side up. But the background, your trees, your bench, your park wall, they're inverted and they're smaller than her hand. We know that's not true. So we've learned some of the foundations for drawing ray diagrams. And we're going to look at what happens, first of all, when objects are more than two focal lengths away from the mirror. That focal length being where those rays of light would converge. For example, on our little insect right here. Situation one, what if the object is greater than two focal lengths away from the mirror? We've learned in previous videos that with any ray of light, there are millions of rays that come off it. That's why anyone in the room can see an object inside your class. So we're gonna just focus on two rays of light. One that has come in parallel to our principal or primary axis right here. And a second one that's going to come and hit it where our primary principal axis is going to hit the middle of our mirror. So we've learned that these rays of light for all of our mirrors, if they come in and hit at the center of the mirror right here, that they're going to reflect back out at the same angle as they came in at. Angle of incidence is equal to your angle of refraction. And so if we measure this distance from our primary or principal axis, the top of that object, if you measure that same distance down below, it's going to make a similar triangle. And what that means is that our angles here are going to be essentially the same. Now our second ray of light here that came in parallel to your primary axis is going to reflect, but instead of going straight back like you did for a plane mirror, or up away from this imaginary a negative focal length, like it did in a convex mirror, this one is going to come down and bend through this focal point. Now, there are many other rays of light that we could consider, but we're going to focus on just these two. We've learned that where rays of light appear to be coming from, it tricks our brain into thinking, because in most normal circumstances it's true, that that's exactly where an image is. And so since this is where the reflected rays cross, that's where our brain 
forms an image. It says, I think it's right there. And so if our eye is over here and these two rays of light are spreading out from this location, we think that it's a smaller upside down. And, and we're gonna look at a new concept called a real image. If we place a screen here, it'll actually show up on that screen and everyone around will be able to see it. And that's gonna be something different we've seen than our plane mirrors and our convex mirrors. So if something is much greater than two focal lengths, it's gonna be smaller upside down and you can put it onto a screen. So that's an explanation of what we're looking at right here. So if an object is really, really far, now we're not gonna draw this one, so I've penciled it in already, but if it's very far from the mirror, so many, many focal lengths, the image that's gonna form is gonna get smaller and smaller and get closer and closer to one focal length. This technique can be used as kind of a quick cheating way to find out what a focal length is for a concave mirror. If you get something that's on the other side of say the playing field at your school or across a parking lot, you get the light from it to hit the mirror and you put a screen out in front of it, not directly in front because then it'll block the light, but just offset a little bit and you'll get a very good estimate for where the focal length of your mirror is. So that's gonna be something that we'll do um, later on for a lab. But for now, we're gonna carry on to situation number two. What happens if we move our object in just a little bit closer? So it's gonna be exactly double the focal length. Let's go see. So just like we did before, we're going to draw two rays of light, one that comes in and hits the center of the mirror, and the other that comes in parallel to your primary axis. And so this one's gonna come in, hit the center of our mirror. And when it reflects, it will come out at the same angle as the angle of incidence. That should be far enough. And as before, we're gonna draw our other ray of light, a representative sample of millions that are coming off it. And when it reflects, it'll come down through the focal point and if we've been fairly picky about our angles and our lines, we should find that this is going to cross right under our object. Now, because my curved mirror comes in a little bit, it's skewing the geometry slightly. But what we find is that it's very close. It should be the same size, still upside down. And if you put a screen here, this is, say, a candle or perhaps a little light bulb, depending on what you use at your school you're gonna get an image of it that's gonna be about the same distance from the mirror as your object. So it's gonna be the same size, upside down, and real. What if we move it in a little bit further? Well, in this case, what we're gonna find is that as we get closer and closer to the mirror, our image is gonna get larger and larger. So once again, we've got our ray of light coming in parallel to your primary axis and then reflecting down through the focal point. You can extend this one a little bit further. I know in advance that these rays are gonna go a little further before they cross. And our array of light that comes from our object, hits the center of the mirror right here, is going to reflect off at the same angle that we came in at, angle of incidence. And so if we get those roughly lined up, our angles are almost exactly the same right there. We should find that those rays of light, the reflected rays of light, appear to cross uh, somewhere over in this neighborhood here. If you compare the height of our original object to the height of the image, the image is now larger than the object. It's still upside down, but in this case, it's going to be further away than our object and these are still real. Any rays of light that cross over on this side of the mirror, where your object is, you can put a real screen there and it's gonna show up. And then things are gonna get a little bit strange. What happens if you get it right at the focal length? If it's at the focus right here, one focal length away from our mirror, and we're looking at our rays of light, well, what's gonna happen? Again, it doesn't matter which order that you draw these in, as long as you draw them both. So very carefully trying to get our angles just exactly the same as they came in at. 
And now looking at our red ray, remember this isn't a representation of the actual color of our object, it's just so we can refer to them by different colors. And when that reflected ray comes off, well, it goes through the focal point, see something a little bit weird. And our brains don't do well with this. Rays of light that are parallel like this, well, they're not going to cross on this side. We could extend them backwards like we did in some of our other situations, but they're still not going to cross. This is a special situation. You've used it before, perhaps if you've had a fancy flashlight at camp, if you've ever used high beams, if you're legal to drive or like playing with the lights in the car. This allows rays of light to come up parallel to one another. I call it a tube of light. If you have a bright light that is right at the focal point, the rays of light will spread out from it, hit the mirror, and they'll all come up parallel. And so that's a really useful tool. But in terms of forming images, this doesn't work. Our brain doesn't compute where two rays of light come in parallel because they don't originate anywhere in our brains. And so our brains see light, but they don't see an image. It's just very fuzzy. When there's no image, it means there's no image properties. It's not bigger or smaller or the same size. It's not right side up or upside down. It is not virtual, it's not real. There's no image. So on the quizzes, when asked about the image properties of this scenario, it's either the easiest question in the world or the hardest if you don't remember this trick. Finally, this one's a pretty useful one. What happens when you get in close with one of these types of mirrors? So we look at a rays of light once again, comes in parallel to your primary axis, and then comes through the focal point right here. And then our blue rays are going to come, hit the mirror, and reflect out at the same angle that they came in at. And so this comes, something pretty close to that. Well, those rays don't cross. But our brains are still okay with this because what they can do is our brain says, well, we just extend that line back then. Whenever you've got diverging rays or rays that are spreading apart, that's another way of saying the same thing. Whenever these are spreading apart, what we find is that our brain says, no problem. I know where those came from. And it extends those lines back for you that we have drawn in our diagram. And so what it sees in this case is a bigger version of our object, so our image is larger. It's right side up compared to the upside down ones we've worked with before. But this one's virtual. If you put a screen out here, you'll just get a bigger and bigger circle of fading light. And if you put a screen behind the mirror, well, that's just not going to work. There's no light going behind the mirror because mirrors are opaque. So when we look at this, the applications uh, are often shaving mirrors or makeup mirrors where you get yourself close to one of these concave mirrors, and suddenly you see you, but much larger. Really good if you're looking for fine details for your makeup, just making yourself look good for the day, shaving, etc. Bit of a summary right here. If you've got an object that is greater than 2F, two focal lengths away from it, then what you have is an object that makes an image that is going to be smaller, it's going to be upside down or inverted would be another way of saying that. And it's going to be a real image you can put it on the screen. At 2F, remember that it's going to be the same size. It's going to still be inverted. And it's going to be real too. And as you got closer and closer, now you're within the region of 2F and F. So you're getting closer to the mirror. And in addition to that, it was still inverted or upside down. And it was still real as well. F, trick question. So put some stars beside that. No image. Exclamation points. And so if you're ever asked, what are the image properties of something at the focal length? It's a trick question. There is no image. There are no image properties. And finally, if you get up close and personal, less than F, in that case, the size is larger. But then we end up in a new situation where we have the orientation is right side up.
and this is a virtual or imaginary image. Why? Why do we get to see the woman with her hand looking humongous? And why are the park benches and walls and trees all tiny and upside down? That is your homework. Explain why the reflected hand is so big and right side up while the images of everything in the background are upside down and small. Thank you for watching and have a great day.